Hey everyone, Chang here and welcome to my channel. In a previous video, I mentioned that every time I encounter a problem that I've never seen before, that I'm not sure of what to do, I try to solve it the dumbest way possible, brute force method. So what I do is I just chip away at the problem, try to figure out some pattern, some formation so that I truly understand what the problem is asking and then solve for the answer from there. So with this kind of approach, there's actually certain problems that I really love and certain problems that I don't like nearly as much. The problems I really love are basically your puzzle type problems, your competition style problems, and your occasional test questions. So standardized test questions like SAT, ACT, AP, those kind of questions. The reason I love those kind of questions is because usually, except for given specific segments, you're not allowed to use technology. You're not allowed to use a calculator, you're not allowed to use a phone, and you're not allowed to use a computer. And yes, I know that seems kind of, why would you put yourself in a situation like that? Those will help you. But from my experience, usually when you're allowed to use those technology, the problem is so much harder because the brute force method in trying to understand the pattern, the formation of the problem, is given to something else, is given to the calculator, is given to the phone, is given to the computer. So just, just because you're mindlessly entering numbers in, you can't actually figure out the pattern. You can't figure out what the problem's actually asking. So that means those problems are usually a lot more difficult than if they don't allow you to use technology. With the ones that you don't get to use technology for, you can actually solve it by hand. You can actually look for the pattern and then, well, guess what, the brute force method work. So those are my favorite problem. For this video, I decided to choose three of them. They're puzzle competition style problem from the 1980s to 1990s, I believe. And they're just fun. Let's take a look at it. I've never seen it before. And some of the wording might be a little off just from my experience of working with like, I guess, uh, problems that are written in the past. Uh, so let's just see what it is, try to make sense of it. And then I'm gonna approach it with the brute force method. And of course, each and every one of those problems, there's gonna be a smart method, an easy method that can you know solve it right away. But imagine if you don't, this is how I would approach it. And let's just have a little fun and see what happens. All right, so for this first problem, we have this weirdly worded problem. Triangular numbers, which I've never heard of before, can be represented by a triangular array. Great. Uh, but at least it tells us this, right? We have one, which is one dot, three, which is one, and then two dots in the next row, six, as in one dot, two dot, and then three dot in the row after that. So we know the difference between a pair of consecutive triangular number is 12. So that means, I guess you could say, we're gonna be looking at a pattern, right? And a pair of them, right, it's gonna be 12. Difference means that, well, the larger number subtract the smaller number. Uh, what is the sum? Well, in this case, I mean, there's probably some formula we can figure out, but at least we can see this. One, and then you put one more row and it's still sort of in a triangular array. I guess that's what they mean, right? We have two here. We put another row, which is gonna be three, is still in this triangular array. So the next one, we can sort of guess, it's gonna be, well, we have one, we have our two, and then we have our three. So we're gonna put one more row. It's gonna be four. One, two, three, four. Okay, good. And how much is that total? Well, we know this is a three, three, that's six plus four. This one is actually 10. So what we did we, is we basically got six and then we added four more because for the next row and that's 10. And well, we can sort of continue with that. So we have our one, our one, our two, our three, our four. And then the next row we're gonna do is gonna add another one. And we wanna make sure that it's still triangular. So it's gonna be five, right? So we know from here, this part right here, these are four rows, it's 10 and we just added another row right here. It's gonna be uh, with five, so the total is gonna be 15. Okay, cool. So just like that, we're gonna start to see sort of a pattern. This one, you add two and then add a three here and then you have six total. Well, we're adding four here, we're adding five here. So I'm not gonna draw it all out, but at least we know. From here on, we're gonna have to add another row and actually we have to increase it every time, right? This one, you increase by one, you increase by one for the next row, increase by one for the next row. So this one, we increase by one again, that's why we have five. The next one we're adding, we have to increase by, I guess, one, which is gonna be six. So without having to draw it out, 15 plus six is gonna be 21. So there's gonna be 21 total. Okay, we're trying to get to the point 
were basically the difference of consecutive numbers. So whatever number we get and the previous number, it's gonna be the difference of 12. Well, okay, we have 21, and this one already gave us like six rows. Well, we can do this at least, if we're lazy to draw that out. We have six rows, okay. And then so the seventh row, for the next one, right, we're gonna have to add seven. So we're adding seven here, that's gonna give us 28, right, because we're adding seven, and that's our seventh with seven rows. And then is that difference, uh, not yet. Okay, so let's see the next one. Well, is the difference is gonna be, well, eight, right? Because we're gonna add another row. There were seven rows, which actually now let us know that there's gonna be seven of those little dots at the bottom. The next one's gonna be eight, so we're adding eight dots. So it's gonna be eight rows, which is eight dots, and we're adding eight here, which is gonna give us 36. Cool, so then we can continue. Next one's gonna be nine, and then so when you add nine here, that's 45. Next one's gonna be 10, right? Which, when you add 10 right here, is gonna be what? 55. Next one's gonna be 11. So when you add it right here, it's gonna be 66. And the next one is gonna be 12. When you add it with this one, is 78. Wait, difference of 12. So from here to here, this difference is 12. So these are the two numbers we're looking for. 78 and 66. And finally, in the end, what is the sum of it? Well, we're just gonna add these two, right? So it's gonna be 78 plus 66, which is gonna be, what is that? That's a 130 plus 14, that's a 144. And so in that case, this would be the answer for this particular problem. All right, so for our next problem, we have this. Two six-sided fair dice are rolled and the sum of the dots are recorded. Basically, you have two dice, they're six-sided, one to six, right, and you're rolling it. Fair dice, I'm assuming, that, you know, there's discounting the idea that it's weighted in any way or, you know, for it to, like, change the probability. And whatever you roll, it's gonna be recorded. What is the probability that the sum is divisible by four? Now, if you're taking probability and you immediately know the equation, and what to do and how to solve it, great. But assuming we don't, which um, I'm not really good at probability, we know that we're talking about two six-sided fair dice. And we're trying to figure out the sum is divisible by four, we can worry about that later. But basically when you roll a pair of dice, at least I know there's several results that are like, will most likely to come up or eventually will come up, right? We have two when they're both ones, right? We have three, we have four, we have five, we have six, we have seven, we have eight, we have nine, we have 10, we have 11, and we have 12, right? This ends when both side of the dice happens to be six. All right, cool. So we have that, right? We know these are all the possible results. Now, each of them have a different probability. And well, let's just say, for example, two. Two, the only way we can actually get it is if both dice are basically one, okay? Three, we know that there's two ways to get it, right? If one of the dice is one and the other is two, or if the other is two and this is one, right? Remember, there are two different dice, so there's always a possibility that it could be one or two in this case. Well, for four, we can know it's a one and three, right? We also know that it could be two and two. We also know it can be three and one, and we can continue. Since we don't know the equation anyway, let's just write it all out, right? For five, we have, uh, what is that? Two, uh, one and four, two and three, three and two, and then four and one. Six, it's gonna be one and five. Sorry, it looks like 15, but just keep in mind that they're two different dice. All right, so one and five, was it two and four, three and three, four and two, five and one. So it looks like the probability is getting higher. All right, well, for seven, it's gonna be what? One, six, two, five, three, four, four, three, five, two, and six, one. So uh, let's just see, let's just do this so it's at least easier to see. Because as you can see, my handwriting in organization is not nearly that great. Okay, now for eight, it's gonna be, well, we can't do one anymore. It's gonna have to be two and six. Was it uh, three and five, four, four, five, three, and then, what is that, six, two, okay? I think that's it, right? Yeah, okay, cool. So, nine, what do we have? We have 
three, six, four, five, five, four, and six, three. I think that's it. Yep. Okay, well, 10, what do we have? Well, basically we have uh, four, six, five, five, and six, four. Doesn't look like we're having much options here. 11 is gonna be five, six, six, five. And notice that, yes, you guys might have figured out a smart way to go about it, but I'm brute forcing it. I'm gonna write all the different possibilities, every single possibilities here, and then try to solve the problem that way. So, I've written it all out. There's no more possible ways these dice can roll. All right, now we're trying to find the, what is the probability that the sum is divisible by four? Well, divisible by four, there's only actually one, two, three. There's three possibilities. Four is definitely divisible by four. Eight is also divisible by four, and 12 is also divisible by four. Okay, anything else? That's it. Well, if that's the case, all right, we can count how many possibility. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's nine possibilities. Nine total possibility of divisible by four out of basically all possible outcome. Now, you guys can count it all, but basically the all possible outcome is all the numbers from one to six on both sides. So total of 36. So this is our probability that the sum is going to be divisible by 4. And of course, you can simplify this. It's going to be 1 over 4. And this is your final answer for this problem. Let's at least go over one more problem. Here we have how many members of the set, this set right here, satisfied any quality of the absolute value of 2x plus 2 is less than or equal to 12. Now. If you want, if you already are comfortable with it, you can actually solve and simplify this before looking at the member. But here's the thing. What I love about this is, well, what if I don't know how to solve this, right? I don't know how to simplify it in any way. And well, if that's the case, I'm just gonna brute force it. Well, the member seems reasonable. I can probably write this all out. We have negative eight, negative six, and it looks like it's just going up by two, negative four, negative two, zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. Okay, well in that case, since I am not entirely sure, what I can do is I can just plug it in, right, brute force it, plug it in, and then see what happens. Well, if I plug in, let's say, let's just go with negative eight. If I plug in negative eight, right, it's gonna be two times negative eight, which is negative 16. Negative 16 plus two is gonna be negative 14. Negative 14, the absolute value of negative 14 is actually positive 14. Less than or equal to 12? No, that's not it, okay? Well, there we go. And I can go on, right, each and every one and just test them all, but then of course, I mean, just because we're brute forcing doesn't mean we have to, you know, at least not try the obvious from the next step. Let's just try something like this, negative four. Well, negative four, okay, if it's negative four times two, that's negative eight. Negative eight plus two, it's gonna be negative six. Well, in that case, negative six, absolute value, positive six, is less than or equal to 12. That's true, so this works. Okay, well, I mean, if that's the case, then we actually have to test this one as well, just in case. Well, negative six, negative six times two is negative 12. Negative 12 plus two is negative 10. Absolute value of negative 10 is 10, less than or equal to 12, that actually works. So good thing we checked that out, right? And then now, I mean, we know that it sort of increases, so we can so we don't have to check all of them just yet. Let's just pick a number. Let's just put six here. Well, negative six works. Maybe six works. Okay. Well, if I put six here, it's going to be six times two is twelve, plus two is fourteen. Absolute value of fourteen is just fourteen, right? Fourteen is less than or equal to twelve. Not really. So in that case, actually, this doesn't work. And just from that itself, and we know that increases, so this is only going to get larger, right? Just from looking at the pattern, we know that these guys are gone. So now we have these guys to check. Well, let's just start squeezing them in, trying to figure out what could pot potentially still work. Well, 4. 4 times 2 is 8, plus 2 is 10. Absolute value of 10 is 10, less than or equal to 12. Well, in that, in that case, that's true. So let's just do here, and then afterwards, we can. We can definitely check 
these guys as well. And if we have time, we should. But if not, well, I mean, we know that from here on it seems to work, and from here down it seems to work. These guys don't work, and this one's just getting, I guess you could say, smaller or more negative. This one's getting bigger, so those aren't going to work. So these are the ones that are going to work. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are six, basically, members. Six members that will satisfy this particular inequality. Now, thank you for watching this video. Hopefully with these th three examples of basically competition puzzle style problem from the 1980s that none of us actually seen prior to today, right? Realize that even though their topics are widely different in terms of, well, still related to math, but widely different topics, right? There's always a way to sort of brute force. There's always a way to basically chip away at it and try to figure out a pattern. This one right here, we just sort of like squeezed it in. The other one, we wrote out all the possibilities. Is it the best way? Probably not. There's definitely more efficient way. This probably definitely has more efficient way of solving it. But guess what? The end result's the same. We're still gonna be able to figure out the answer. Even if it takes a little longer, even if we have to work a little harder, it's, it's not a, I get it or I don't. I always have a way. Hopefully this video illustrates that. Thank you again for watching. See you in the next one.